All right, hey everyone, doing this solo today. This uh, podcast is just to kind of set the scene for our upcoming season, 2023 season for CFFB. Um, those who don't know me, I'm Brian, I'm the uh, commissioner, uh, and I'm also Wisconsin. Hoping today we can just kind of go over the... Um, coaches poll kind of set the scene for the season and talk about some upcoming activities to be planning for and be mindful of um so without further ado let's just kind of get into this hopefully it won't take as much time um so last two weeks i've had a poll available to everyone uh that they could vote however they like however they see fit on who they thought the top 25 teams were we had 19 submissions from 19 different coaches uh, with a variety of results that came in and were seen. Um, We also had a lot of different results. Last year we had a lot of uh, results that were um, one team had all what was on every top 25 ballot this year that's not the case last year we had one team that was pretty much unanimously like the best team by the coaches poll that's not the case this year um but let's start with some honorable mentions so kind of at the cusp here there's some notable teams that just didn't make the cut for the preseason top 25 uh wake forest tennessee florida state central michigan all had more than two votes uh, in the top 25, or more than two submitted polls in the top 25, especially notable Central Michigan. Um, one of the few minor teams that got some love in the polls, but didn't even crack the top 25 still. So pretty low um, breakout, didn't make any top 10 votes or anything like that. Um, so I think, <clears throat> Taking a look at some of those teams, let's just start with Central Michigan. <clears throat> Central Michigan being a minor minor uh, conference team has got uh, kind of some things to consider. They're projected to win 10, 10 games this season through the Martin metric. They're supposed to have a top 25 uh, starting offense this year and have a average bench. Um, supposed to have a pretty good all play with that top 25 uh, starting bench with an all play just under the in the quarter top i think the thing that really does them in this season is that they got again same kind of thing that happens with minor every year is that their conference schedule's kind of weaker and it ends up doing them in with the uh, opponent all plays and so some of those things to kind of take and really lift their their uh, ranking score is to really be kind of hitting it hard in the um, non-conference schedule. And I think in Central Michigan's case, they did a a pretty good uh, mix. So teams like Michigan State and Duke are not supposed to be projected to be really competitive teams, but teams like Vanderbilt, Wake Forest um, are supposed to be more competition. So when it came to the Martin metric even, um, Brian, who was the coach there, he would have finished in the top 25 as it stands. He might have done better had he even played two more tougher opponents and snuck up a little bit. So 10, 10 wins for them. His top players are supposed to be this trio of Trevor Lawrence, Jamar Chase, and, and Jalen Waddell, which are pretty good for minor league core. He's expected to come in second in his conference, number one in, in the um, minor divi- uh, MAC division. So Central Michigan's pretty good. We'll go to Wake Forest since I mentioned them. Wake Forest has got a new coach this year. I think the second coach in two years, uh, David. Um, They are kind of right there on the cusp too. They're supposed to have a pretty good same kind of thing with uh, Central Michigan, kind of a similar type starting lineup, um, similar depth, um, similar all play. I think the real difference is that he's got like the third toughest schedule projected this year and it kind of shows he plays central michigan he plays washington state he plays kansas unlv all for his non-conference and then in conference he just even specifically in his division he's just got north 
Carolina State, Clemson, Louisville, uh, Syracuse, which are all supposed to be pretty good opponents this year. Um, he somehow got a top five vote. I think that might have been uh, Jake who um, skewed his, his polling to have Wake Forest up there, but he's supposed to be a good team. I think he's going to be a bit of a challenge to have enough wins. If he does win some of these games, surprises, I think Wake Forest could be way up there uh, in the polls this season. Um, what was another one that we kind of had on the cusp? Tennessee. We'll give Tennessee some love. Ethan. Ethan's always good to give some love to. To the admonishment of Joey. But Tennessee could be in tougher waters with this Jonathan Taylor um, situation being kind of in a holdout PUP situation. He's not playing the first four weeks, which really does, um, I think, kind of put Tennessee on the back foot here. He doesn't have nearly as good as a starting lineup projection as the previous two teams we kind of talked about. Um, and a lot of the, the water that the team is being carried on is by Joe Burrow and Jonathan Taylor. And Burrow with his hyperextended knee and Taylor being out for the first four weeks. He does play kind of a lighter schedule, so he might get by unscathed, but if it lingers into week 7, 8, 10, 11, I, th I think he'll, he's going to be having a tough time cracking more than 8, 9 wins this year. So... Tennessee could be in the mix for some things. He's got a kind of a lighter schedule for some non-conference and cross-divisional play. He does have some good competition in his division, which will make it tough for him to, to break that ceiling, I think, unless he, he gets lucky. Um, and I think the other one I kind of mentioned was Florida State. Uh, Michael... It's been Florida State the entire time. Back to the ACC. He's another team that I think is kind of done in by his division schedule. He's kind of on the same tier uh, strength-wise of a, a, a squad as um, Central Michigan and um, uh, Wake Forest. But I think, again, he's projected to lose five straight games in his division, which I think is unfortunate for buys. He's... Currently projected only to win six games, so not even technically bowl eligible um, based on this margin. I think it's just completely due to the, the tough schedule that he plays. He'd probably have a few more wins and be a bowl eligible team if he either squeaks one out or had a, a different non-conference schedule. So that's kind of those things. We'll stay in the ACC uh, Atlantic Division, because the top 25, first uh, team on the top 25 at 25 was uh, Walters um, Syracuse. Kind of seeing a thread here with the ACC Atlantic teams, it's just kind of a really, really competitive division this year. Um, a lot of talent swing swung from the Coastal to um, the Atlantic this year with uh, Virginia kind of pushing all its chips in and Clemson kind of gra grabbing some talent and some other people getting some other talent um, as well as some injuries kind of taking some uh, coming back. Walter was a team that was kind of decimated by injuries last year and um, he got eight top 25 votes, um, no top 10 or five votes so clearly he's on the back half of a lot of people's polls when they voted. Um, He's currently projected to win nine games. He's kind of got a, a bit of a mixed bag in the non-conference schedule with Northwestern as a good good game. But beyond that, he's got two kind of middling opponents with Colorado and Iowa um, and a cakewalk in Toledo in week one. Um, and then once he gets to his division schedule, he kind of is projected to be kind of an upset with wins over Clemson, Wake Forest, and NC State later in the year, but does kind of stumble against... Um, Florida State and, and Louisville. So he could be a team that surprises. He could be a team that I think, given the projected uh, all plays, he could be someone that maybe sneaks up a few more spots in the more of a top 15 range by the season's end. He's got a pretty good stable of players. Um, quarterbacks maybe not such top end with Brock Purdy as his projected top quarterback, but he's got C.D. Lamb and Ramondre Stevenson as uh, his primary scorers this year so very interesting to see Syracuse here you definitely hit some challenges the last couple years uh, staying healthy and, and putting to better 
putting together a competitive team, but I think Walter's uh, year is, is starting. But that's a tough 25. 24, we got uh, Indiana, and then 23, we'll have Kentucky with uh, defending champion Navy, Navy at 22. Started off here with Indiana. Indiana last year got kind of beat up with uh, injuries, and then his quarterback was Zach Wilson, his only quarterback, and it kind of just the bottom fell out for the team, and it definitely didn't turn out such a competitive thing as I think his preseason was projected to be like number two or number one and be really competitive, and that just didn't happen last year due to injuries. Um, it's projected to have a really good team. I think he does still have Jonathan Taylor, which is going to be another big challenge to manage this season. Um, he's his best running back, and he's also relying on Sam Howell to be his best quarterback this year. So, some a few unknowns that could make the boat rock a little, but he's supposed to stay in the top 15. Projected starting lineup. He's got a really tough schedule, um, but he's also supposed to put up some points. So, if things work out, break his way, he could be really good. He's got tough games against Ole, Ole Miss, Kansas, uh, Louisville, uh, Iowa is a pretty good stretch the first five weeks of the season. Um, he does play in the Big Ten East, which is supposed to be a little lackluster this year, um, with the toughest kind of challenges coming from Navy. Um, and his only other loss in the Big Ten East is projected to be Michigan, which if you look at the score, Michigan's not even projected to get 85 points, which is a little on the lower side. So, um yeah, it'll be interesting to see what Indiana does. Uh, they're at the 24th spot, and they're coached by Brent. Um, Kentucky, it's our favorite high school graduate, Devin. Coming in at 23rd out of the SEC East. Uh, SEC East, very similar to um, the ACC Atlantic with some really tough co uh, opponents this year coming out of that really competitive division. Um, Kentucky was able to kind of restart not really restart but retool retool is a better word uh, Devin was able to get Am uh, Amon Rossi Brown in uh, transfer portal from Texas A&M due to his fire sale and um, I think that kind of bolstered uh, Kentucky's languishing um, wide receiver room this year but he's got Tua Tonga Valoa Kenneth Walker has his three other projected top scorers for his team this year um, he did get one top 10 vote in the coaches poll, eight um, top 10, top 25 votes. So you can see a little bit of a, a difference in what he got voted at versus uh, Walter at Syracuse. He's supposed to have some of the better depth. I think he's got a pretty good uh, stable of quarterbacks, if I really can recall. Um, and then, like I said, he's, he's kind of in that same tier with started projecting lineups. Uh, Hopefully his depth carries out. His toughest games this year are going to be uh, Florida State, Louisville, UNC, Ole Miss are all really tough kids the first five weeks. Takes a little bit of a lull with Alabama, Missouri, South Carolina, and then kind of finishes it with a four-week uh, gauntlet between Georgia, Tennessee, East Carolina, Vanderbilt, and then finishing up with Ash in Florida. So last year's SEC East champion, um, he, uh, he's got his title to defend, um, stole it away from Georgia there, I think, at the end, and, um, yeah, I think there's a, a lot to be seen. I know Devin is, is very, uh, used to the format, so not, not too worried about him putting together competitive teams altogether. Um, yeah, so things to consider here. Um, number 22 was our defending national champion, Navy. Navy's the top rated, uh, no, not, not, no, he's not. Um, second highest rated Big Ten East team this season. Defending national champion, as noted. I think he voted himself rightly so as uh, number one in his coach's poll. Um, he has the crown, he might as well proclaim it to everyone. Um, but Michael's got a pretty good team. He did lose some players last year. Um, he does have Jalen Hurts, Najee Harris, Ramondre Stevenson as some of his best producing uh, point goers this year. Um, he does have kind of a tough, tough non-conference schedule. That's um, 
Air Force and Marshall and BYU are all really tough games. He does go a little bit lighter on his division, uh, cross division or cross conference uh, opponents with Purdue and Notre Dame this season. Uh, I think he kind of went with a harder non conference schedule, given that it, the Big Ten East is kind of a lackluster competitive uh, notion. So if he can kind of get some more all play or opponent all play out of his uh, non conference schedule, the better he'll do in the rankings. Um, because, you know, look at those games. The only one he stumbles on is um, Ohio State. So he's tied, I think, projected to be tied with Ohio State in the um, division for division wins. And because of the head-to-head tiebreaker right there, he projected to be out of the conference championship game, which is interesting how those head-to-heads work out sometimes. But, um, yeah, Salvo's going to have another good team. I think he'll have another good year. I think this is... The window's closing on this team. He's had some really good years. The last couple um, all came to a head last year where he won the national championship, so he can't complain. Um, but I think he's he's trying to run the rest of the, the road that he's got laid out for him before he's got to start thinking about the future. So we'll see what he's able to do with Navy this season. Um, next couple teams up is at 21. We had Texas Tech at 20, NC State. Uh, 19 is Boise State, 18 is Oregon State, 17 is USC, 16 is BYU. Kind of a, a run of Pac-12 teams that we'll get into here in a minute, but we'll start with uh, Texas Tech. Brendan. Brendan has had some pretty decent squads. I think the past he's had a lot of challenges because the Big 12 South has been so competitive for the first couple years. Big 12 South is not that competitive this year. Uh, there's a lot of teams that have some graduating talent, and clearly the, the North has put together far more uh, competition. It's kind of rolling to the North to be the competitive division this, uh, this year out of the Big 12. But Texas Tech's projected to be the second best uh, Big 10, a uh, Big 12 South team this year. They got uh, five votes in the top 25. They got three in the top 10, one top five vote. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that top five vote, but projected to win eight games would be projected to get at the end of the regular season 33, uh, the ranking um, top, just outside the top 25 for started projecting lineups, but he's got some depth to his team. Uh, like I said, this number, the OAP, usually in the Big 12 South has been elevated. It's really carried a lot of the ranking success as a, as a division. Uh, it's coming down. There, he's down here at the average mark, right around league average uh, this year at 50%. Uh, he does play a few tough opponents with Oregon State and Boise State and Florida State. First couple points of the year. Is, he does have one uh, tougher uh, cross division. Right now, both are supposed to be tough because he's projected to lose in both the Big 12 North teams. But uh, Kansas is supposed to be a tough out. And then the only other division game that he loses is uh, just by a slim margin projected right now to, to Houston. And that and the cross-divisional games are could be huge for the Big 12 race this year. So Texas Tech, led by Justin Fields, Lamb, Najee Harris is his big three. Um, we'll be interested to see what they could do. They could be a team that's in the conference championship game, but they got to maybe hopefully win a few more of those cross-conference games. Uh, games and make sure they beat uh, Houston to really stand a chance this year. Down here at 21st at 20 is our resident doctor, medical student, Jake Banana Man. Jake last year I think was the highest scoring team, had a really good team, but I think had a few weeks where he stumbled and I think the team that came out of the ACC last year was not him. It was Wake Forest. Yeah, I think he lost to Wake Forest in... Is that it? Yeah, he lost to Wake Forest by just under a point last year. And that lost him the tie, head-to-head tiebreaker against Wake Forest. And he lost the division because of that so he did make it to the playoffs with what an at-large bid he did have a really good team he did lose a lot of talent this year i think he had one of the highest uh graduating recruiting bonus dollar amounts last year um 
but somehow is still a good squad. I think this is like one of his last couple of years. He loses Jalen Hurts next year, um, as, uh, among with a few other, I think, seniors. But his team is still projected to have a top 25 scoring offense. His depth is kind of sucked out of that. I think he had a much better depth last year. Uh, his opponent on play... It's kind of in the shitter compared to some of the other ACC Atlantic teams. I think that's a byproduct of him scheduling pretty light non-conference-wise and playing um, some weaker teams in the uh, cross-division or cross-conference games with Charlotte and Georgia Tech. But his toughest games are obviously Vanderbilt, Wake Forest, Clemson, Florida State, Louisville, Syracuse. He's projected to win kind of half of those games so if he can maybe flip one or two more he's going to be higher in the, uh, the rankings projected to be 18th with uh, at the end of the season with 10 wins so going to be good it's kind of a matter of um, can some of those breaks in the division kind of work his way can he hold up on his depth uh, I think are all things worth noting and, and being on, on, on the lookout for when it comes to uh, NC State uh, now we're going to make our way to the pack 12. I think number 19 was Boise. Boise State, Jim Clark. Jim is had the same kind of trio of players since the beginning. He's had Justin Jefferson, Trevor Lawrence, Jamar Chase kind of leading his team. They do it again for like the third year in a row. Last year, I think his team was pretty good, but I think he stumbled to Washington. Yeah, he was tied in the three-way race with uh, Washington last year, and I think there was a uh, division tiebreaker. So he's he's been right there. His team's been really good. Um, Voting-wise, he's gotten 11 votes. It's quite much higher than some of the other ones, uh, other people we've seen uh, in the coaches poll so far with a top 10 and a top 5 vote, or a top 5 vote in somewhere. Um, projected to be second in the division again, uh, which is unfortunate, I think. Part of that is the fact that somehow schedule Air Force, which might have been a mistake if he's trying to capture some conference wins. That's going to be a really tough game. Um, his week six game against Air Force, projected to lose by 15 points or so. Um, he does play kind of a mixed bag in the non-conference schedule. We're playing East Carolina, Clemson as good teams, and then play and, and Texas Tech then plays a really weaker opponent in Fresno State. And then surprisingly, I think there's some bye weeks that catch up to in Week 13, and he's projected to lose to Washington State. That game, if holds true, could be the deciding factor. You might be looking at burning red shirts at that point to hopefully hold whatever lead he might have in the, in the Pac-12 uh, North. But Pac-12 North is going to be competitive again this year. Um, it'll be super interesting to see where Jim can land. He's, he's been right there the last two seasons, uh, and I don't think any this year will be any different, but um, worth, worth checking out. At 18, though, surprise. Coming of age, our resident... Uh, Jason of Oregon State is... Uh, Voted in the top top twenty, or uh, yeah, top twenty coaches poll, and projected to be in the top twenty by the end of the regular season. Um, expected to win, or be tied at least with the um, the Pac-12 North uh, conference title. So, going to be super interesting there. Uh, see his team. He's come a long way. His team was like mine the very first season of CFFB, just dog shit. We loaded up on freshmen, redshirted them all, kind of carried those same uh, tactics, and, and now we're, we're on the up and up. And he's got kind of um, a pretty decent team, a little lighter on the depth, which hopefully means there's not going to be issues when it comes to health or covering bye weeks. Right now he's only supposed to really have one kind of bad week, and it's coming to week seven against Boise State, so that, that could hurt him if it holds true. Um, Kind of the point of having some more depth. He does play myself, Texas Tech. Um, it's kind of his two tougher games. Uh, this uh, non-conference schedule plays BYU, Washington State, as mentioned before, um, and Boise State is kind of his, his tough outs this season. Um, 
hopefully the rest of his games kind of get buoy as his all play keeps him competitive. But it's Jason. Um, he's got Fields, Chase, and, and Lamb as kind of his three big contributors this year. Um, so we'll see where, where he can go and if he can finally make the top 25 for the first time in, in the team's career. Um, and then last little run is BYU. BYU is got 13 votes. Uh, they have been an interesting team over the last few years. They've been decimated by injuries like J.K. Dobbins, um, a few other players that they just can't have healthy all at the same time. And he was, I think, is projected to be a good team last year, and it just didn't work out for him. Um, almost a top 10 projected starting lineup. Supposed to have a lot of depth this year. Has a lighter uh, opponent all play. Kind of what I'd like to see go up a little bit more, maybe more towards the 50s to be more comfortable. Um, because it does seem to suffer for his projected uh, rankings. If everything holds true, he's supposed to be just outside the 20, uh, top 20, which, you know, you win 10 games, you'd like to be a little bit higher so you have a better bowl, bowl game chance. But he does play the weaker opponents, Rutgers, Buffalo, uh, uh, Purdue, all kind of lower third teams of the league. Does play uh, Navy, does play Air Force week five. I think that's... Potentially a big mistake again if looking at division races um, and also does project to lose to Oregon State and Boise State. So kind of the teams that he's chasing. So kind of unfortunate. He's losing the games he projected to lose. Hopefully everything health-wise stays the same. Ben is due for some good fortune in that front. Um, otherwise, I think he's going to have his most successful season uh, so far in this league. But that's uh, kind of the run on... Pac-12 teams there. Oh, I skipped over one. So sorry. Ben is is 16. 17 is USC. USC is coached by Michael. And Michael is in the Pac-12 South, which is different than the last three teams we covered. Uh, he is supposed to have an average average kind of uh, all opponent schedule. He does schedule pretty light in the non-conference outside of Cincinnati and and maybe Utah State um, and North, Northern Illinois, or it's okay. But the rest of the schedule is kind of a cakewalk until he gets to Week 12 and has to play uh, Air Force. So I think Week, week 12 is going to be his biggest game. Um, he did load up on a lot of upperclassmen this year. He kind of took the uh, the real-life Florida State approach and, and Colorado approach where you get a bunch of transfers in and they immediately make your team better. Uh, but there is a big question mark now with Jonathan Taylor not being available. He does play a little bit lighter schedule, so after four weeks go by and he doesn't need him, that could help him uh, later in the season and kind of stay afloat. But I think it all comes down to Week 12 for USC and for a lot of the Pac-12 South uh, race. I don't think a lot of other teams are super competitive this year when it comes to that group, but... That's, that's uh, him, and he's 17th this year, not um, not the uh, 16 as it would allude to, but he's 17. So, we're up in the top 15 now. We go to our top ranked uh, Big Ten East team at Ohio State. Uh, we get into, I think, our first, yeah, our first Big 12 North team in Cincinnati. Our only ACC Coastal team in North Carolina, and then uh, we kind of hit a little run, which I'll stop at those three before moving on to a little run of more Big 12 teams uh, between tw 10 and, uh, and 8. But next up is Ohio State, Cincinnati, and North Carolina. So Ohio State, another new coach for the second time in a, two years, uh, Adam. Adam's kind of got a... Another pretty good team. He went and got B. John Robinson this year, um, which I plan, I expect him to play. He's supposed to have a top 20 starting uh, lineup. He's supposed to have a, a top 10 depth uh, lineup. He's supposed to be just under or just above average in his or opponent all play. So that's that's good for him, uh, especially playing in, like I've said, the Big Ten East is, is kind of projected to be a little bit lighter. He's supposed to win the Big Ten East this year uh, with the number one ranking. Like I said, he ties with uh, Navy, and I think he wins on a head-to-head. -head. So week nine is super important for him. 
Not conference wise, is pretty light. US, US, UCF, Texas State, uh, Oklahoma, Arkansas. Uh, nothing really crazy. Uh, no really projected top 25 teams there. So he should be 4 0 coming into cross conference and plays uh, Minnesota, who's going to be kind of eh. Sorry, Keegan. And then uh, Illinois, who's going to be better, but I don't think is up to the up to the uh, Ohio State ranks. Uh, and then he plays all the, the familiar foes in the Big Ten East and is supposed to kind of roll through most of them outside of that uh, Navy game and then surprisingly loses to Indiana in Week 12. So he could feasibly be 13 wins and, and be even higher, probably top eight uh, by the end, he's supposed to be in the top, just outside the top ten. I think if he had just a little bit more on all play and a little bit more out of a point all play, he'd be right there, potentially as an at-large bid for for it uh, consideration. But right now, it's supposed to be in the Big Ten Conference Championship. And then we went to I think it was Cincinnati. Yeah, Cincinnati. Another newcomer, Cincinnati. I think last year he was projected to be kind of outside the top 25, if I recall, preseason wise. And then, yeah, they had a good run. Won a, made it to a bowl game, almost won the division, but um, definitely was not as good as Marshall in Kansas last year. But Tony, um, supposed to be a lot better this year. He's got Burrow, ETN, Cam Akers as his kind of three best teams. He's but it's supposed to have a lot of depth. Uh, top 10 in depth, uh, top 15 in, in projected starting lineups. Got some love in the top 25 with, with 12 out of 19 votes. Uh, projected to win 11 games. Where he loses is Kansas State and, and West Virginia. West Virginia one's not too surprising of a loss. The Kansas State one's kind of shocking. I think he probably has a um, buy or two that week that he loses them. Has kind of a, a weaker... Uh, conference schedule where he does play a top 25 team in USC, but that team doesn't have Jonathan Taylor, so I don't think it would be nearly as competitive as it would be indicated, indicative of. Uh, plays Alabama, Arizona State, Nevada for the rest of his non-conference schedule. Outside of those two losses, he does play some tough opponents with Kansas and Marshall. Um, they'll be tough gets, um, but he's projected to win them, so he's, he's supposed to be good. He might catch a few teams at the right time, like I think Bet the week 13 against Kansas. Kansas has some bye weeks that makes this disparity in projected score to be larger than it is. But good team. Good to see Cincinnati up there. He's had some kind of on that ascent, like Oregon State, rough first year. Second year has been better. And third year, I think he's he's getting to the peak of his competitive um, chops there. And then at 13, he's supposed to be... North Carolina. As mentioned, North Carolina, the only ACC Coastal team, got 14 out of 19 votes, two top 10 votes, uh, projected to kind of walk away with the ACC Coastal Division this year. Coached by Matt Ramsey. Just outside, just under the top 20 in, in projected starting lineups. Does have some pretty good depth and uh, just outside the top top quarter and depth score um this is the concerning thing you could be a lot higher if this was this was better he probably should have scheduled a little bit tougher non-conference opponents this year to really boost his team's profile to make them uh much more have a much better chance at an at large bid just for security reasons directed to win 12 he could have not played lsu not played stanford Played some even just middling teams and maybe have a better all, uh, opponent all play to get him even closer to that at large bid without really sacrificing too much risk. Could have been a better scheduling thing. Because um, then he plays his division schedule Charlotte, Virginia, Pitt, Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, UConn are all like in that 80 to 70 projected point range. It's just kind of like bluff. Not a lot of. Now, it doesn't do a lot for you. If I was like a committee or something, you'd be looking at that and kind of thinking, this team hasn't played anyone. They're kind of just given the division championship in, in some regard. 
Uh, and I hope some other coastal team uses this for bulletin board material like Duke or or you, um, some other team. But it just kind of feels like North Carolina is like just the heads above the rest of that competition. So he's got Herbert, Chase, Waddle. So definitely we're warranted to have that kind of uh, pedigree and, and view. But we'll see. He's supposed to be pretty good. Um, hopefully the projections hold. Like I said, we're now kind of running into this gambit of Big 12 teams with uh, Houston at 12, Marshall at 11. We do get our only top 25 minor team, UNLV, sandwiched between two more Big 12 teams, Kansas and, and West Virginia. So we'll get our top ranked uh, Big 12 South team here. Jake is our first flawless team. Um, Projected schedule, uh, supposed to win 13 games. Kind of, I don't think any really close games as it stands right now. The biggest caveat is he's not projected to have a lot of depth with that 61 ranking. That's not great. And he is Jonathan Taylor. So those two things could catch up to him if things don't play out correctly. The benefit is week one plays Purdue. Week two, he does have East Carolina, so not too crazy. But I think the rest of his team should be good enough to win that game. He does play San Diego and Wyoming, San Diego State and Wyoming, which are not cakewalks, but not the hardest teams in the world to beat. So, and then the rest of the way, it is just a walk in the park. Army, Kansas State, Texas, Baylor. Um, his toughest team or closest game comes week 11 against Texas Tech. So... Big 12 South seems like it's a two-horse race between Texas Tech and Houston. And right now, Houston's looking like it's going to win pretty comfortably uh, outside of that one game, which anything could happen one game. But right now, the rest of those games, the margin of points being scored is just is wide, which is so crazy to think about when I remember saying numerous times last year, Big 12 South felt like uh, just a dogfight, bloodbath, ready to happen. Um, it's changed to change the division. Um, Houston's kind of, I think, running out of on his last team before having to hit the reset button as a squad. Um, but, yeah, projected to be in the top eight. So if everything holds true, he's scored enough points, gotten a high enough aggregate all-play score in the top 25 to kind of buoy his, uh, his ranking. He could be right there for uh, an at-large bid in the um, – playoffs if, if he if he needs it but that's Houston at number 12 Marshall is number 11 Marshall is coached by Jay Jay is our uh, first season's national champion um, so pedigree there he's had the same core of players that had won in the first year uh, won in the next year Justin Jefferson Trevor Lawrence Jamar Chase are the three that have carried him through Last year being really good, and the previous year winning the national championship. Supposed to be good again. Has uh, a lot of love from the coaches' poll. 11 votes, three in the top 10, two, two, vote, two of those votes in the top five. And then I think he gave himself his first place vote. But, you know, when you win the national championship, you can kind of puff your chest out and, and say what you will. 10 projected wins. Supposed to be projected to finish in the top 15. So, very good team. Plays me in the in college game day week one uh, in Madison. So Marshall, him and I kind of felt we both had really good teams. We could play and kind of steal some extra dollars to go towards recruiting next year, which I thought was pretty smart on, on his and I our parts to just kind of really set the scene that we think we both could just get a few extra dollars and it worked out. Um, has some other tough games. Plays Navy week three, which is not not tough. Not you know our, our, the two last national champions squared up against each other. Week three is, is pretty good. Uh, week four plays Air Air Force. Not helping. Week five and six kind of played some softer Big Twelve opponents um, and gets ready for his division schedule, which he projected to lose a few of those games. So those cross conference games could pull 
really good for him to kind of keep his self in that division race if he does lose or stumble to like the Cincinnati and West Virginia. Top 10 in uh, scoring, uh, scoring starters. Pretty average depth, so we'll see if that holds for him. If any injuries spark up or bye weeks, could he be in trouble or, or falter? Uh, supposed to have a tough schedule, which I think it shows with the, the teams he's playing, not non-conference and then in his division. So that's Jay. Jay will, Jay will have a competitive team once again this year. Brings us to our minor team for this top 25. That's UNLV. Coached by Steve Schultz. Steve has had a same type of profile. I think this year is a little bit better, but um, he's historically been this like glass cannon team where he's put out a really good starting lineup, um, not had a lot behind it, and a few injuries catch up to him where it makes him stumble through the season. But I think last year, if I can recall, he won. Won 10 games, just lost, I think, to New Mexico at some point in the season that cost him the division. So he's he was there last year being really close to conference championship, which I think would have helped him. He's the next fla team with a flawless record this year. Does play to have the benefit of playing in the minor and probably the weaker minor division in the Mountain West. Um, as you can see, 96 up on all play is really bad <laughs> benefits that he's supposed to score a lot of points top 10 but it's kind of like he ends up being a little bit you know it says top just outside the top 25 in aggregate but i wouldn't believe that holds true in the season so he might win a lot of games but his uh, ranking might kind of be suffering from that because he just doesn't play tough opponents throughout the year he could have maybe played a few more tougher opponents than smu or auburn and kind of boosted that score a little bit higher to help him, especially because they don't get an auto bid for conference championships in minor. So he needs to put a little more emphasis, especially with windows and minor being so contracted. You can't like expect to be good for three, four years. You kind of like, I think maybe good this year. I got to make every decision count because it's not many other opportunities that you can keep fighting. It's, it's just so competitive, so... Um, sparse and talent in the in the minor it's it's really tough um plays wake forest uh washington state which is good wyoming is probably his only other opponent for the rest of the season that scores over it's projected score over 90 points that's that's a big challenge so jalen hurts is going to carry him justin jefferson is going to carry him throughout most of the year he does have jk dobbins he's got a pretty good starting lineup that's been shown so not really worried about him scoring points. Hopefully de depth doesn't play too big of an issue. And hopefully he gets a few more points out of these teams to really kind of elevate his all opponent all play. At number nine, I think, is Kansas? It's Kansas. Yeah, it's Kansas. Reigning Big 12 champion. Kansas. Puffin. Yeah, Kansas last year won the Big 12 Conference Championship. Made it to the playoffs. Lost in the playoffs. Did beat me in the playoffs. I think he made it to the National Championship. Yeah, made it to the National Championship. So he was a runner-up last year. Had a really good squad. Uh, I think he beat me because of TJ Hawkinson having his 30 point three touchdown blowout game in the playoffs but that's just what happens uh, it's supposed to put up another good squad same thing that's kind of been the big caveat that I play on a lot of teams that have this but teams that have just Jonathan Taylor kind of has an additional question mark especially for a team like Kansas who's kind of middle of the pack with depth so that could play a bigger role if he doesn't have someone to line it up if he doesn't have a tight end to play for the first four weeks he does kind of have a mixed bag in the first four weeks of the season with Missouri kind of being an easy out but then Wake Forest Indiana being kind of tough gets uh, right after Colorado is is kind of middle of the pack team does play Baylor week five so that should be an easy game Texas Tech will be a little bit tougher and then he gets ready for his division schedule or he stumbles a little bit against 
Marshall in Cincinnati and I think kind of cost some potentially the division uh, opportunities. So a few of those games can turn around. He's going to be um, kind of right back there at the, the top. He could very well see two years in a row in the playoffs, but he'll need to kind of flip a few more of those games around. He's supposed to be tough. He's supposed to play tough. Tough opponents this year, so... He did get a first place vote in Coach's Bowl. I don't remember if that was him or someone else, but uh, did get some love. Does have 13 other uh, votes in the Coach's Bowl for top 25, so well deserved. And then coming in at number eight is Bobby. Bobby, um, another team I think the first year kind of punted, didn't put out the best team, much better last year. I forget what he ended up doing in the regular season. Let me quick check. Eight and five. So, yeah, much better season than what he had the first year. But this year, he's supposed to take it to another level, get 12 wins. His only blemish on the projected schedule is week 10, and I think that's all due to bye weeks. Has a projected top 10 scoring team, top 10 in depth, which is huge. He's supposed to play a pretty average schedule, which I think benefits him playing in a really tough division kind of holds his, his water where he could be in that all play consideration if his team plays as well as it's projected to do. It's supposed to be in that projected six spot, which is kind of right in that sweet spot where you were really considered for at-large bids. That six to eight spot is about the eight spot of the rankings when it comes to uh, week 13 and a week 13 is so crucial if you're kind of in that spot you have got some chance at a playoff spot for at large bid but if you're kind of in that 10 12 13 spot you really don't have any shot so um outside of auto bids but he's projected to win the big 12 north he's uh you know got a good squad got a deep squad gonna play well he's got Jalen hurts Jalen waddle Ramondre stevenson and that's just some of his, his primary starters. So uh, Bobby's going to be good. Uh, I think he's going to play well. Didn't get any first place votes. They get three votes in the top five. Um, so they get some love. And I think people notice that he's, he's going to have a better squad than some other teams. So that's West Virginia. Now we're kind of creeping up to the top here with Northwestern, uh, number seven. Ole Miss at number six. Uh, Clemson. And number five, and then Georgia at number four. Uh, so we'll start with Northwestern here. Northwestern coached by Benson. Benson last year fell just short of the Big Ten West title. He is projected to get the Big Ten West title this year by having an unblemished Big Ten record. Does play me and, and is projected to beat me in the Big Ten West. Um, so 12 wins, only losses against Ole Miss in week three, uh, which is no, no shame in that. Um, just like uh, West Virginia, top 10 starting offense. Even have a better projected depth mark than uh, West Virginia with a rank number two. Big question, not really big question because he's got a lot of depth, but does have Jonathan Taylor, so might not have nearly as good of a, a starting lineup as he does. Uh, projected, which may be coming to play week three. Um, might have had a better shot had Jonathan Taylor played, but if he doesn't, you know, week three is it could be lost. But average kind of opponent I'll play. Like I said, Ole Miss is a good team. Does play myself. Does play Syracuse. Um, Ohio, uh, Iowa, and Illinois are going to be some of the tougher games for them in the division. Um, going to be good. Supposed to be kind of right in that five to eight spot in the projected rankings. Um, so I think Benz is going to be good. Projected to win the division uh, in the Big Ten West. So kudos to him if he, if he does win that. At uh, number six is Ole Miss. So we were just talking about him beating Northwestern. Ole Miss. New coach this year, not old A, it is Allen Anderson. Allen, one of the few teams supposed to have an unblemished record, and I think that's a lot to do with how bad the SEC West is supposed to be. SEC West is, you know, got Texas that State, LSU has got Auburn, Texas A&M, 
uh, all, all supposed to be pretty poor teams. Uh, you know, none of them are projected when he plays them score over 80 points. Um, so he's not supposed to get a lot of points. He's got a low uh, opponent all play. Um, does have one of the better projected starting lineups with the second best starting lineup in the uh, league, led by Jalen Hurts, Justin Jefferson, Najee Harris. That's pretty good to, to have. Um, got a lot of love in the coaches' pool. Almost 10 top five votes. That's, that's pretty fucking good. A lot of people like Ole well, Miss's his lineup, and I do too. Um, toughest games this year are going to be Indiana, Northwestern. Kentucky, and then whew, besides those three, which are really three tough games, Arkansas is probably the only next toughest, and Alabama. Not great. Not great. Don't love the SEC West. Not going to be a good division. Um, and ain't no SEC East. Let me just say that. But Allen, first year coach, is going to learn a lot, going to probably hopefully have a lot of fun. Um, and hopefully his team can, can give him something to, to cheer about this year. It's number uh, six. And number five is uh, Shithead Daniel. So Daniel last year was the like unanimous, almost unanimous, number one uh, in the preseason coaches poll. Lovingly didn't make it anywhere near there. I think he won like six games. Let's let's relive it. What did he win last year? Six games. The guy didn't even wasn't even bowl eligible. He, he lost so many games. Started out really well, and then just fell apart. Oh, you love to see it. Just lost to teams. Played scored a lot of points. I think he started out really bad, and then the second half of the season came along. But I think he lost Jonathan Taylor last year. After the uh, medical, he wasn't playing very well, but supposed to rebound this year. Does still have Jonathan Taylor, still a question mark, given the PUP, which could factor in the Boise State game. Um, supposed to play kind of a softer non-conference. We talked about the ACC Atlantic, going to be a tough out, so there is some strategy behind it. Uh, projected to win 12 games, only blemish comes at the expense of the 25th ranked Syracuse Orange and I think that doesn't cost him the division surprisingly but doesn't mean there's not an opportunity that it could at somewhere other some other team that he plays did get two first place votes in the coaches poll got 10 of those votes went in the top five so clearly people think he's going to be good again uh, I think he will, unfortunately, be good. I hope he loses every game. Um, he doesn't deserve happiness in this league. He never does. He needs to lose at something in fantasy. Last year was a great start, and hopefully it can continue. All right. And then number four is Georgia. The top ranked. No. Not our top ranked SEC East team. Georgia, though, is coached by Daryl. Daryl wanted to make sure I gave him some love this year. Didn't have to, Daryl. Getting some love from the coaches' poll. You got 14 top 25 votes. Not as much as Ole Miss and Clemson, but still four top five votes. Pretty good. Um, projected to win 12 games is only loss. You can see it right there at the bottom. Week 13 lost to our favorite top Joey of Vanderbilt um, his team's supposed to be good got Justin Fields, Jamar Chase CeeDee Lamb, that's a pretty good core the same core he's had for that led him to the playoffs last year um, supposed to play kind of a softer schedule surprisingly enough and I think most of it comes from his first six weeks Western Michigan, Cal Maryland, Georgia Tech, Alabama, Texas A&M. That's really soft. Probably one of the softer first six weeks of the season. Does obviously pick up some ways, so his opponent all play is going to be a problem. If he can hold on to this, 
he'll have a good shot of an at-large bid because uh, he's currently not projected to win the division. Surprisingly enough, I think most of that comes to this Week 13 game. Um, Daryl's going to be good. Daryl was good last year. Um, hopefully he doesn't get too upset knowing that some of this soft scheduling stuff could cost him potentially if, if things don't work out his way. But going to be a good team anyway. Number one starting projected lineup uh, in the SEC East. And then that's number four. Number three is Air Force. Number two is myself in, in Wisconsin. And number one burr, 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 is our number one cheese boy Italian friendo um, spicy meats a ball Joey Agresti. Uh, let's start with Todd and Air Force. I don't know how this happened. don't know how the vote worked out this way, but not enough teams voted for him in the top 25. He had only 13 top 25 votes, but 12 of those 13 ended up in the top five with five first place votes. It's projected to be, based on the Martin metric, the number one team at the end of the season. It is supposed to get 13 wins. Has a really pretty easy division um, games. It's supposed to have a top three lineup. Uh, not sure how he ended up three. I, I voted for him number one, but it's going to be good. Air Force, uh, Joe Burrow, CeeDee Lamb, B. John Robinson, going to lead the way for this team. Uh, does have some pretty decent depth. Not great depth, but does have some depth. I think a lot of it is on his wide receiver side. Uh, toughest games this year, Navy, Marshall, BYU, Boise State. Um, I think that kind of makes up how he somehow has a top 25 opponent all play is those five games because the rest of the season outside of maybe Colorado and USC it's going to be kind of easy games for him to win I think Air Force is going to be there supposed to win the Pac-12 South um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens but I think Air Force has got a real shot this year number two is myself um, Wisconsin Badgers 16 top 25 votes, three first place votes, eight top five votes. Um, so not nearly as uh, unanimous as what Air Force had, but somehow I think because I got 16 compared to his 13, I percolated above him. I am supposed to have kind of an average to below average opponent schedule. I did that by design. I'm trying to hedge some bets that I'm focusing more on the division uh, than I'm trying to bolster some some uh, at-large bid because right now I'm projected to kind of fall outside of it. So I don't think I have much of a shot. Um, wanted to kind of make sure I have a strong enough thing to kind of be in that space. Maybe not don't make the playoffs, but I'll be in that space to begin with. Number one projected depth lineup. I think a lot of that's attributed to my quarterbacks. I have three projected starting quarterbacks on my team, which will hopefully uh, cover any injuries. It's supposed to be led by Herber. Jamar Chase, B. John Robinson, to name a few. Toughest games this year are supposed to be Marshall and, and pretty much, I'll just say Northwestern. Um, other games are going to be kind of, Oregon State will be kind of good, Wyoming will be kind of good. Um, outside of that, I'm kind of hoping that the Big Ten is just kind of very few teams that are really good and the rest is kind of uh, easier to walk through. But all that to say, all comes down to one week for me in the division, and that week I lose, and because of that, I don't have the division uh, title uh, for the second time in their back-to-back years. So, kind of how the margins of this league work. You, they're pretty razor thin. They unforgiving. Um, so it's it's worth noting that those types of things definitely could prove to be a factor. Uh, could still schedule soft, lose out of the playoffs, and don't win the division title for a chance at that, you know, auto bid. So that's how it works. And then finally, whew, I'm surprised we haven't heard a lot more about, about this from him, but Joey is supposed to be the number one team, top six, uh, started lineup. I don't know really how he beat Air Force or some of these other teams like Georgia or something like that, but 
Top six, kind of a top 40, just a little bit above average. Uh, the depth has Jalen Hurts, Justin Jefferson, Kenneth Walker as his main three. Uh, does have a tougher schedule, top 25 um, in, in opponent all play, where he's playing teams like Central Michigan, NC State. Uh, then he's got, you know, Kentucky, Georgia, East Carolina. Tennessee's going to give him some points that week, um, among some others. I think he just kind of had a well-rounded enough schedule with some good, tough division opponents. He's really put his, his his good foot forward. He's only supposed to be top two, though, by the end of the season. So I think Air Force kind of does some leaping to get over him. But um, he's number one this year uh, for preseason, so kudos to Joey. Definitely does have a good team. Not going to take anything away from him on that. As the best wide receiver, projected wide receiver and best quarterback, it goes a long way um, in a league like this. So... He'll be good. I think he just missed out on the division last year uh, to Kentucky. I think some tiebreakers didn't work his way. They kind of had a three-team race, and things didn't shake out the right way. But uh, this year, he's supposed to be good again. Um, so that's the top 25. We'll do a little quick exercise here, kind of review some of the rankings uh, projected end of the season. Funny enough, projected uh, Heisman winner this year is supposed to be Houston's copy of Jalen Hurts, top, and it's supposed to be the win the top quarterback uh, projected um, award, player award. Top wide receiver, Justin Jefferson from UNLV, and the top running back, don't think this is going to hold, given he's out for a few weeks, but Jonathan Taylor of Houston, so that obviously could change pretty quickly with him not being played. Um, let's quickly run through some of these conferences. ACC, like we mentioned, Clemson, North Carolina, NC State, Syracuse, all supposed to be really good. We didn't talk about Louisville, but Jeff seems going to be right there. I think he's got Najee Harris. He's got, I think, Joe Burrow. Is it Joe Burrow? Let's, 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 let's give Jeff some love here. Justin Fields, that's what it is. Justin Fields does have Najee Harris. Does have Jonathan Taylor, so but he does have a kind of a weaker couple of games to start. It does get a little tougher, and then obviously have Jonathan Taylor around this time, he could be making some some noise in this season. So that's ACC. Like I said before, North Carolina really doesn't have much competition. The next closest team for conference wins is six from Duke, two away. All the way down here, ranked 46. That's going to be a easy one. Big Ten, Northwestern up at the top. Ohio State wins over Navy because of that tiebreaker game projected win. Um, supposed to have five teams in the top 25. Some teams that fall just outside Illinois, Iowa, Nebraska are projected to be just right outside that space um, with eight, nine wins. So they'll be. Some good teams to look out for. Some good com competition for some teams. Um, Big 12. <laughs> kind of the same thing of ACC Coastal. Houston, Texas Tech. Kind of in there. T TCU does kind of pop its head. But otherwise, a lot of these teams are 50 and below in the rankings. So it's not great. But West Virginia, Ohio, uh, Houston are supposed to be up there with a lot of teams that are right underneath them. Cincinnati, Marshall, Kansas, all going to be fighting for the Big 12 North. Uh, let's go to Pac-12 before we jump to uh, Minor. Minor, Air Force, Oregon State, supposed to be fighting at the top of that group. LB and Colorado State, what are you doing, man? Not even bowl eligible this year? Let's, let's get those wins up. Come on now. Get it. Got a, you scheduled pretty soft this year, in my understanding. You need to win those games. Um, surprising to see Washington State. I think there's. I would think they're supposed to be a little bit better than what's projected. So uh, Arizona, Oregon, Jesse's taking over that team. I think they'll be kind of good. Um, checked in around the middle of the, the division. But surprisingly enough, I think at the time this projection happened, UCLA had a few graduates that was counting towards this projection. I had to remove them. Um, so his might be a little bit of like a, a, a false positive. I don't know what you want to call it. It's kind of like a 
placebo effect of a projection for UCLA. Um, not really true to form what that is. He's, he should be farther down uh, as a squad, but it's Pac-12. SEC, Vanderbilt, Ole Miss, 1-2, top of their divisions, um, clear cut ahead. Georgia kind of that's nestled into that second, so they're kind of the only other competition, but then you look at the rest of these two wins, three wins away, they kind of beat up on each other, kind of average to maybe a little bit above average. Teams, surprisingly enough, like Mississippi State, Brahmi has a really weak schedule, wins enough games to have 10, but doesn't break, just breaks the top 50 in the rankings, which is, you know, kind of how their rankings work you might win 10 games but you don't get a lot of love because you the schedule light he doesn't necessarily schedule light he plays in the garbage SEC West so that kind of plays out for him where he's got to play teams like Texas A&M and that doesn't do him any favors he just got to play Auburn LSU Texas State all those are sub 70 in the rankings um just indicative of how much the SEC West is not what it not what it should be. And then finally minor. UNLV at the top, Central Michigan up at the top of the MAC. Uh, San Diego State and, and Wyoming are supposed to be kind of competitive in the um, in the uh, Mountain West. The other two, three teams, Northern Illinois, uh, Ball State, Kent State, you know, I think they're going to be kind of a tier below. So there's like two tiers underneath those top competitive teams, Central Michigan and UNLV. Um, and then as per form, you know, a lot of teams that are just bad, and that's just kind of the scarcity of talent that the, the minor goes through. Um, it's, just, it's just a tough, tough, tough conference to, to get out of and play well and have a good team. Um one team I want to pause on is Kent State, because he asked me to. Taylor, Taylor, I don't, I don't know why you scheduled Jake and I. Let's just be frank. If you thought your team was good, you you misread your team. Um, playing Lou, week three in Baylor, that's that's a good decision, because um, you're not gonna get for playoffs with this team you're not going to be striving for it you're not that competitive you're going to waste Justin Herbert's final year uh, well, maybe even next year you got to consider transferring Jamar Chase I don't think you're going to be good enough um, somehow got two votes in the top 25 I don't know how that happened but uh, someone loved him someone gave him some love he's going to be bowl eligible probably win a few games um, probably not going to win the Mac unless something breaks his way but he loses to Ball State and Central Michigan and I think surprisingly loses to uh, Western Michigan so those just kind of don't do him any favors um, but yeah that's Taylor and his underwhelming Kent State team I thought they were going to be much better this year than, than what I think they're actually going to be but those are some things to look out for uh, let's jump to postseason. Week 14, this is kind of what the conference championships are projected to look like with Ohio State, Northwestern, uh, Big Ten Championship going to Northwestern and the Big Ten West. Ole Miss, Vanderbilt. Ole Miss sparks an upset. Week 14 against Vanderbilt wins SEC. So as much, as much illusion that I make about the SEC being just dog shit division they somehow win the division the SEC West so shocking uh, Central Michigan versus UNLV for the championship goes to UNLV uh, Big 12 Ohio State keep, uh, Houston keeps its uh, undefeated streak over Western Michigan uh, big one in Bank Pac-12 Air Force versus Oregon State going to Air Force and then unfortunately not always the good guys win but Clemson projected to win the uh, ACC championship in week 14. Boo! 
Week 15, we got a lot of the bowl games that happen. So Arkansas versus TCU, Wyoming versus East Carolina, Outback Bowl, uh, Ohio State versus Kansas, Ole Miss, UNLV in the playoffs, Liberty Bowl, Texas Tech, Texas Tech versus San Diego State, Alamo Bowl, Central Michigan versus Kentucky, Birmingham Bowl, Northern Illinois versus Michigan, uh, Independence Bowl, Utah State versus Bowling Green, Quick and Lane, Quick Lane Bowl, <laughs> Kent State our underwhelming uh, compatriot Kent, uh, Taylor versus uh, Duke, Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl, Bo Boise State versus Indiana, uh, Camilla Tax Bowl, uh, Florida State versus uh, I think Florida State was the one six win team that got invited to a bowl game because we had an, an odd number of projected uh, bowl eligible teams. Uh, they get to play against Ball State. Iowa versus Nebraska. Also in the playoffs, Vanderbilt versus Houston. Vanderbilt gets in, obviously, with the um, at-large bid. BYU versus Syracuse in the Duke Mayo Bowl. Uh, Clemson versus Northwestern in the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. Uh, UNC versus Oregon State in the Arizona Bowl. Marshall versus Cincinnati in the Music City Bowl. First Responder Bowl between Oregon and Bo uh, Boston College. Hawaii Bowl, Mississippi State, UCLA. Again, I think UCLA is iffy projection there. Tennessee versus Illinois, the Bad Boy Mowers, Pinstripe Bowl, and Colorado State. Uh, uh, is that right? Let me double check this. Did he win enough games? Huh. I just have these projections wrong. So I'll have to. Let me relook at this. Because he ain't supposed to be there. Um, Pop Tart Bowl, AB versus Louisville. USC versus NC State in the Tech Slayer Gator Bowl. Holiday Bowl, Wake Forest versus Colorado. Georgia versus Wisconsin. Cheese at Citrus Bowl. And then also in the playoffs, Air Force versus West Virginia. So week 16 is the semifinals of the college playoff. Ole Miss, Vanderbilt meet up again. Ole Miss beats Vanderbilt's ass yet again. Air Force takes down the bad guys. Our league nemesis, Clemson, in the semifinal. And then leading into the final, we have Air Force versus Ole Miss. And Air Force wins. Project the win. So they're supposed to go whole 17-0 this season. It's supposed to be at the top of the final projection. National championship, Air Force that's a crystal ball, what it's supposed to be telling us based on the Martin metric. Um, so hopefully everyone found that a little fun exercise, kind of see what maybe we can see this season. Um, and I'll just kind of review some of the other top 25 teams. A bunch of them. Central Michigan sneaking in the top 25. Maybe holds on to the top 25. Tennessee somehow sneaks in. Do the teams fall out um, based on that. See us all the way at the bottom by the end of the season. That'd be a great exercise. Oh, shock to no one. Toledo and Texas A&M, bottom of the league by the end of the season. So, um, so before we wrap up, a few housekeeping things. Uh, let's pull up the, the league page. Teams have been given access to taxi and uh injured reserve uh, starting yesterday. With that in mind, we've had a few teams asking questions about the new rule. So, if we don't remember, I've got Louisville. Let's just pull up their entire roster here. Louisville, they have these, uh, they put a bunch of players on here. The new rule is that the taxi previously had locked it prior to the start of the year, so you would put on your um, all your rookies that you wanted to have a traditional red shirt. Go in your taxi squad, they'd have to stay there for the entire season. That rule changed this off season with a rule vote by everyone uh, that passed majority, and so now both the IR window and the taxi window is the same. So that means they both close and lock at uh, the kickoff of the Thursday night game for week five. Uh, meaning, weeks one through four, 
you can start freshman as many times as you want. No requirement on number of starts. You can start them for all four weeks. You can start them one week. You can start them no weeks. And you can still, prior to week five kicking off, place them back on your taxi squad and lock them for the season. They will have to remain there, though, from weeks five on to earn a traditional redshirt. Bit of a rule change. I think a lot of the emphasis that was the, behind this proposal was to give teams a little more flexibility to know where they sit as a competitive team before making this decision. And it makes it align with the um, injured reserve. So just kind of fits and makes it a little more seamless in that distinction. Um, so it does change the game. It does make non-conference a little more unpredictable where some bad teams might be better, could be worse depending on who it's being played. But um, yeah, that's the big rule change. So here, I've got a lot of questions. You can move them back and fro for uh, the first few weeks at your leisure. Um, but know that once week five kicks off on that Thursday night game, both IR and taxi lock, you can't make those changes after that point. You'll have to ask me to make promote someone, but once they are promoted, they can't be put back on after that point in time. So. Some things to deliberate, but it is a big rule change. People should take advantage of it. Use it to their uh, whatever likeness they need to to fill gaps, cover injuries for the first part of the year, find out how good their team is. Um, and then lastly, we will be starting uh, Debbie draft in a few more weeks. Reminder that the... Debbie picks can all be found on the recruiting database. You can see who's picked what. I do have to go through and, and confirm with uh, players that did not declare this past year. So like UFC or ACC, I'll have to go and confirm with uh, Scott that he wants to keep Braylon, at, Braylon Allen. If he does, he gets to keep him for his second round pick next year or this year. He'll serve as his uh, selection. But he does lose the rebate amount by five dollars. So instead of twenty dollar rebate uh, max, he gets up to fifteen next uh, for if he he commits. If you don't want to let him go, you get that spot back. Uh, if you want to keep two players, if you happen to pick two, uh, I think there's very few instances of that. But I think maybe Pac-12, Caleb Williams. Yeah. So USC pick Caleb Williams and Nick Singleton both were not draft eligible last year. Uh, if he wanted to keep one of these two, whichever one, Caleb Williams or Nick Singleton, if you only wanted to keep one, one would fill in this second round slot and he would still have a first round pick available. If he kept two, which he could, they'd fill both and he would just get no picks. The rebate would be reducted and we would just skip over him come uh, draft time. I think it'd be like a, a keeper, per, per se, in a, in a draft. But those are the two big things to be looking out for. This kind of kicks off week four. So something to, to look forward to, and I will be reaching out to the teams that had the uh, players carry over and see if they want to keep them or not and let them know what those, those, those changes are. But football starts tomorrow. Hopefully everyone says that's a lineup and, and has that set. Um, and we start having some fun. But thank you, everyone. Ask questions in chat. Let me know what you thought. Give feedback on this uh, preview and... Let's enjoy some football this season. Thanks, guys.